Okay, let's see if we can do some of the visual representations of probability uh, here using paint. Okay, well what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just drawing a little Venn diagram, which is just a visual representation of the sample space. Now, we can define events on the sample space by grouping particular observations in an area. Uh, here I have it uh, grouped in a circle, which is the way your book tends to do it, and I'm going to name that, say, Event A. Now, everything inside that circle shares some sort of uh, event characteristic. For instance, if the uh, sample space is all the numbers between 1 and 10, um, A might be uh, numbers 2 to 4. Okay. Now, you can do it in a circle, though that doesn't always necessarily look like the best way to represent something. You can also uh, partition off the sample space um, in sort of rectangles. For instance, I could uh, partition it off like this, um, and then the area on each side over here that I'm indicating, um, over there, okay, um, that I'm indicating over there would be everything with a similar characteristic. It looks about the same size as event A, but I could call it something like event B. Now. Okay, so that's just a way of representing the events, similar to what your book does. But like I said, sometimes it's useful to uh, partition off the sample space in rectangles rather than in circles. All right, now let me go uh, um, clean this up, and uh, we'll take a look at another way of representing um, some of the events, particularly when you have uh, two events that interact. Now, what your book does, again, is they uh, tend to label their events as a uh, um, events and the complement of events, and again, that's uh, quite useful. So uh, that would be event A again. Everything outside A becomes the complement of A. All right, so it would look like that. Now, if you have two events on the sample space, like A and B we had before, um, those events might or might not touch each other. Here I've got, uh, I'll call event C, and now event C and event A clearly don't touch each other, so A and C are what are referred to as mutually exclusive. Be very careful, that is not the same as being independent. All right, now, let's say that we have uh, two events, however, that do overlap, and I'll call these uh, second event here event B. So there's event B, and I've got A and B overlapping. Now the overlap area, that looks sort of like that football, see that area in there? I'll go uh, shade that so it's easier to see. But if I uh, shade that, I'll give it, uh, say, a nice bright blue color. Um, there's the intersection of events. So that blue area is A intersect B. Now, A intersect B is, again, just that football. Now, consider for a moment what a union is. A union, which is written as the probability of, say, A with a little u and then a b, the probability of the union is equal to everything in A as well as everything in B. So that's the probability of A plus the probability of B. But the problem is, if I have everything in A and everything in B, I've just double counted the football. So I have to subtract off 1 measure of football, so A um, intersect B. Okay, so that will be my union of events here, and uh, I will get, there we are, the statement for the union of events. All right, now, um, a very important idea here um, on when we're talking about probability is to think about um, the event size relative to the sample space. Okay, that's fine. But when we're starting to talk about uh, what the book calls conditional probability, um, though I tend to just lump it all together with Bayes' rule, um, it has to do with the size of events relative to different sample spaces. For instance, um, if I'm looking for the probability of the intersection of events, again, it's that blue football, and the probability of the intersection of A and B is the blue football relative to the entire sample space. But what if I want to know the size of that football relative to either A or B? Well, the size of the football relative to A or B is what's called conditional probability, or also Bayes' rule. All right, so in order to uh, think about this one, Bayes' rule is the probability of 
the uh, intersection of events um, relative to either of them. Now, I'm going to look at the probability of A given B. That's the way this is going to be written. The probability of A given B is the probability that A occurs if we know B has occurred and only B has occurred. So, looking at a conditional probability is the equivalent of shrinking the entire sample space down so that you no longer have the entire Venn diagram representing your, space, your sample space, but instead you're restricting yourself only to times when event B has occurred. Now, if event B has occurred, then the only time that A can occur is when the intersection occurs. So the probability that A occurs, given that we know B occurs, and that little slash is read as the word given, then the probability or conditional probability of A given B is equal to the probability of the intersection of events relative to the size of B. Or in other words, it's the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of the conditioned event B. Okay? So literally I am looking at the probability of A given B is the size of the football relative to the size of B. Now, that being said, we have to be very, very careful with the next definition. The next definition is what's called statistical independence. Independence. Independence is when knowing that one event has occurred, say event B, knowing an event occurred does not affect your estimate of the other event occurring. Okay? Now that's wildly different from mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive in this picture are events A and C. They don't overlap. Independent events are when knowing one gives you no information about the other. Hence A and C cannot possibly be statistically independent. Because if you know event C occurs, A cannot possibly have occurred because A is not ha have any overlap whatsoever with C. So, statistical independence is when the probability of event A occurring is the same as the probability of event A occurring if we know event B occurs. So, looking at that formula, that's the definition of independence. However, we know that conditional probability, which is just another way of rewriting A intersect B, means that independence is the probability of A is equal to the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. Now if that's true, then we can rearrange that to say independence means that the probability of A intersect B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. That is a very, very rare condition and yet many students when they're going off looking for something like the A intersect B probability love to just multiply probabilities of A and B together because they would like to think it's that easy. It rarely is. Statistical independence is very, very rare and very unusual. So don't assume it unless you really think you have a good reason to. Alright, so that's conditional probability and Bayes rule. And that gets us a long way towards doing the homework because you often have to think through using those two together. Now, there is one other very, very useful concept. That very useful concept is called the theorem, theorem of total probability. The theorem of total probability is the idea that if you look at an event, say in this case event B, event B is actually made up of a couple of different pieces. The blue piece, which is where it's intersected with A, and then the remaining part of B. Well the remaining part of B, why don't I just color it so that we're sure we all know exactly what I'm looking at. The uh, remaining part of B that I've colored yellow here is the po portion of B where B overlaps with not A. Well, not A is this A complement right here. So, the theorem of total probability just means that I can find the probability of event B, the probability of B, oops, let me change color here. I can find the probability of event B by literally just adding up the two pieces. Well, what are these pieces? Well, the blue part is the probability of A intersected with B, and then I have to add up the yellow piece, which is the probability of B intersected with not A, or the complement of A. 
okay, fine and dandy so far. But we don't always have those sorts of pieces for things. So what do we have? Well, go over here and look at um, the statement of conditional probability or Bayes rule. Now, if you're looking over here at the statement of Bayes rule, consider for a moment how one can rewrite that. The probability of A given B is, according to Bayes rule, it's equal to the probability of A intersected with B divided by the probability of B. By the way, make sure that the divided by probability on the right is the same as the one on the left after the slash, just to place students make mistakes. All right, so we have this statement of Bayes' rule. But this statement of Bayes' rule can be rewritten because algebra works. That's an important idea here. Algebra works. OK, right there. But since algebra works, I can rearrange Bayes' rule to be the following. The probability of A given B times the probability of B is always going to equal the probability of A intersected with B. Now, this is true. Sorry, let me clean that up. This is always true whether or not A and B are statistically independent. So this is the way to find A intersect B. OK? Just be careful. But if we can write Bayes' rule that way, that means that we can actually rewrite the theorem of total probability up here on the first line using statements of Bayes' rule. So that first intersection of events becomes the probability of A given B times the probability of B. Oh, sorry. If we rewrite Bayes' rule down here, it's A given B. But since I'm looking for B, um, there's another statement of Bayes' rule that works. For instance, Bayes' rule, the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of A. Right? Has to be. Go back and look at the definition of Bayes' rule. All right, so now what I'm going to do is look at a restatement of this one, which is the probability of B given A times the probability of A is also going to equal to the probability of A intersect B. By the way, A intersect B is the same as B intersect A. All right, so now let's go back up here to the top and look for the probability of B. Well, the first statement is the probability of A intersect B. And now going down and looking below, I find that that is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A. But now I have that second piece. That second piece is the probability of B intersect uh, the complement of A. Well, that one is going to get me the probability of B given the complement of A times the probability, that's a times actually, times the probability of the complement of A. Now, that seems rather long and conv conv convoluted, and I guess I suppose it is, but it's extremely useful. Matter of fact, you'll need to do it for the homework, so I suggest you pay close attention. OK, so there is a the theorem of total probability, the visual representation of probability, and uh, most of the rules that you're going to need for a while. So there you go.